is a big, big deal to us in this church. Because you know why? We all need it. We're all in the process of being saved and we have to deal with this flesh and situations in our lives. So we're all in the process of being saved and we all, every one of us, there's not one in this house that does not need deliverance. And it's gonna happen today if you open your heart, if you open your, your mind and your heart to the Lord, he's gonna touch you mightily today. I, uh, I really do feel we have to take our Pentecostal pedigrees uh, to the side today because even you, 40 years in the church, 30 years in the church, 15, 20 years in the church, you need deliverance too. I needed deliverance when I came in as a new convert, but I still need deliverance today. I'm always seeking that new level, that other level, that new dimension, and none of us have arrived. We, uh, this um, Pat, last week, I'm going to share a lot about what happened last week, share the highlights of the message in Michigan. I preached at a ladies' conference, and the Lord moved in a mighty way. He was there in a sweet way. I'm going to share some of the outcomes. But I did a Zoom call Thursday morning at 7.30, and I got on the subject of the old timers, and I began to talk about Nona Freeman and, and Billy Cole and T.W. Barnes and all these great, great elders of the faith who were so powerful. And when we were at the conference, I guess I was still pondering them. And Sister Renee Hoffman, of those of you who know brother and sister Hoffman, she's precious. But let's face it, sometimes ministry doesn't always become vulnerable. And she was on the platform Claudette Walker had just spoken. She ministered virtue back into Claudette Walker. And something got a hold of her. And it was so beautiful. She was dancing and twirling like the angels were dancing with her. And she said, she cried and she made herself so open and vulnerable. And she said, I never wanted to be a pastor's wife. She said, I begged Harold to not let me be a pastor's wife. I would prefer to be a teacher or go out to work, but I did not want to be a pastor's wife. She knew too much, raised in a pastor's home, and it was just too much on her. And then she said, well, God, if you've called me, then if I'm going to do it, if I'm going to be a pastor's wife, I'm going to have fun. So P-O-M, I'm going to have some fun doing this. I need to lighten up, Francis. I got to lighten up a little bit. But I thought about Billy Cole. And Billy Cole literally said, I was so happy he said it. He said, you know, I never studied. He said I would, I, it just blows my mind. God used him mightily, you know, a, uh, a, a, an apostle to Thailand and Ethiopia. And he said, I'd be getting ready. Okay, Lord, you got to help me. I'm going to preach. He said, I'd be walking out the door and God would say, say this. And he would say that. And we know Billy Cole's ministry, those of us who have been around a while, he's gone on to be with the Lord, but we knew how powerful he was. And that, when she spoke that, it was deeper than her words about just having fun. It was like, just give yourself to God. Get in a raft and let the current of his spirit take you down the river. You ever been tubing before? <laughs> and just let it take you down the river. Sometimes we want to put our feet down and control control the, the current, but it's, we got to just let it go and let God do his work. It was so, so, so powerful last week. So I really want to share some highlights. My title is Finding Freedom today. Somebody's going to find freedom. You know, we, we need deliverance and deliverance is so important to us. Deliverance and restoration. I think if we had any kind of soapbox, it would be deliverance and restoration because that's the business God is in. We can't do jack squat if we're not delivered and if we're not restored. We're wasting our time. We're spinning our wheels. We need God. We need him so desperately. Yes. But as I said, we came into the church and we needed deliverance so, so badly. But then as I became more aware of Pentecost, I realized it wasn't just him and I, that
that needed deliverance, but I know there's from left to right and front to back, we all need deliverance of some sort. And I have to say, as I said a moment ago, the spirit of the Lord is here to deliver today. Um, the theme of the conference last week was this one thing. And I love the Apostle Paul. He had a whole lot to forget, a whole lot to let go of. When he said in Philippians 3 and 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one, this, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind so I can reach forward. If I'm holding on, I'm not reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So that's what we got to do. We got to forget some things. It's necessary to us. It was necessary to the apostle Paul. He had to be able to let go of his past mistakes and his past failures to be able to move into all God had for his life. And I think it's so powerful. Forgetting, the Greek word for forgetting simply means to forget. Just get it out your mind. Just send it into oblivion. Just let it go and, 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 and totally just lose it. Forget about it. It's bogged us down for way too long. And then the second message I spoke about was on forgiving. And I was concerned that Sister Hoffman would think, why is she preaching the same thing again? And I, I thought, I wrestled with it. I was like, let me, let me make sure, let me read these messages to make sure they're not the same thing. And they were not the same thing because forgetting is getting it out of our minds. But forgiveness is getting it out of our hearts, letting go of the anger and the resentment and the grudge holding and the bitterness and <clears throat> so that we can be free. So the truth is, though, I'm looking at many of us who have lived long enough that life has happened to everyone. Has life happened to you? Life's happened. Life has surely happened to us. So we all are in need of forgetting and forgiving today. So many of us have been held back in every way. We have stuffed those feelings and those violations deep within our souls. And we don't even realize they're still there. We have them relegated to this little closet over here, but they're deep, deep down because we don't want to deal with them and we don't want to feel them. So in many cases, though, they have limited us in so many ways in, from being all God created us to be. And I believe that he sent me on a mission today so that you and I could be set free from everything that has ever violated us, everything that has betrayed us, everything that has ruined our reputation, everything that has beat us up, everything that raped us or molested us, everything, we can let it go today. We can forget those things which are behind, reach forward to those things which are ahead and get them out of our guts, get them out of our hearts. The painful, and, and, and when, when Brother Osborne, when our, the guys went to men's conference a few years ago, he preached a message that we needed to hear desperately, and that message was, turn the page. Do any of the men remember that message? It was such a powerful word. He used Ruth as his main point, and in, in chapter one, there was a lot of tragedy and loss that Ruth went through. And had she gotten stuck and paralyzed in chapter 1, she would have never been able to get into chapters 3 and chapters 4 where God blessed her exceedingly abundantly. The kinsman redeemer was, had his eye on her. He married her. She worked in a field, but then she became the owner of the field. And then she became in the lineage of Jesus Christ, King David and Jesus Christ. So think about had she not turned the page in her life, what would have been forfeited within her life? The painful or difficult events that have happened in our lives were not meant to destroy us. They were meant to prepare us for what God has in store for our lives. 
He has written every word in your book, every paragraph in your book, and every chapter in your book. So we were not meant to get paralyzed in chapter one when there's entire, there's an entire book, all these experiences, all these highs, all these lows, all these joys, all these defeats to get to. The end of your book has not been written as of yet. POM, it's time to turn the page. Elizabeth Smart was a beautiful young teen from Utah. She came from a very proper family. And if anybody had a right to get stuck and paralyzed, it was her, if you know anything about her story. Because on June 5th of 2002, her life drastically changed. Her and her sister were in the, living in the same, sleeping in the same room. A strange man came in, put a knife to her throat, and said, don't utter a word. I'll kill you, and I'll kill your sister first. And he led her to the back of their house, up into the mountains. She said, so far up that we began to go down. And she said there were tarps, and there were tents, and she was scared to death. She said, no one ever gets freed. They're, they're always murdered when they get kidnapped. And she just knew her life was going to be over. They sat her down on a bucket on the ground and a strange woman came out of the tent and she started sponge bathing her as some ritual and put a, a strange robe on her. And then the man who kidnapped her, he came out and after she sobbed and she was crying, she composed herself and he said, now you're going to be my wife, and we're, you're going to perform wifely duties. They, she had a chain around her ankle, and she was bolted to the ground, and this started a nine-month-long, drastic, dramatic, painful nightmare for this young girl. But at some point in the journey, she made up her mind, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to survive this. And my captors are not going to win. And that's the place all of us need to get to. We're not victims. We're victors. We're going to be triumphant. The day after she was captured, her mother spoke life-changing words to this girl. And I don't know if she had not spoke these words. I don't know if she could have continued to go forward. She said, Elizabeth, what this man has done to you is terrible. And there are no words strong enough to describe how wicked he is. I would have used probably a few other words and probably torn him apart limb by limb. But thank God for Elizabeth's mother. He's stolen nine months of your life that you will never get back. But the best punishment you could ever give him is to be happy and to move forward with your life. By feeling sorry for yourself, holding on to the past, Dwelling on what's happened will only give them more control and power to steal more of your life away from you. She said, don't let it happen. Justice may or may not be served. Restitution may or may not be made. But don't you dare give them another second of your life. Hope, that had to change the course of her life. Hope was breathed into this broken young girl. And, and I want to, it, it kept her from being stuck and from being paralyzed. Something like that can make you lose your mind. But sometimes you got to pull, pull, your, pull your bootstraps up, pull up your big girl panties, and hit the road. We had not talked about those big girl panties in a while. We put on your big boy panties and your big girl panties and head forward. Let go of the past. I want to reiterate those same words to you. Don't you dare give them another second of your life. Go on and be happy and let God heal you. Today is the day you will find freedom and deliverance. Elizabeth Smart, she's moved on. She's become an advocate for rape victims and for sex trafficked victims. She's written a book. She's produced a movie. She, she's done a TED Talk. 
and she's been on media all around the globe sharing her story. She became a college graduate, she got married, and she has two children. And instead of allowing this event at such a young age, 13, 14 years old, to destroy the rest of her life, she's chosen rather to help others and to put her pain to great use. And, and she made her pain count. And that's what we have to do, make our pain count. The Holy Ghost moves so mightily because so many people need deliverance. And the stories of deliverance were so incredibly powerful. And the consensus of the, the whole conference was something fell off of me that I did not know was on me. And, and as I said, I mean, people were holding on to things for decades. They didn't even realize they were still holding on. And something fell off that they didn't even know they were, they were focusing on subconsciously. They knew it was there, and it was a constant reminder to them. So my second message was on forgiveness, and forgiveness, trust me, is never an easy topic to talk about, but it's needful. And I shared how when we don't forgive, it destroys the insides of us like an acid, and we're not hurting, we're not hurting our perpetrator. We're hurting ourselves when we, because our forgiveness isn't about letting them off the hook. It's about letting ourselves off the hook. And so when we don't forgive them, we give them more of our lives. You remember Dr. James Hughes? He's been here a few times and such a powerful, powerful man of God. He's very serious. So when he came to a women's conference, do you all remember that? About, about three years ago or so, we were in the midst of a situation and what do you know he preached on forgiveness and I was like now what do you know about forgiveness well I soon found out what he knew about forgiveness he said when he said this I almost fell out I couldn't believe it because he's such a proper staunch he doesn't smile a whole lot but he's so amazing and he said um, how he was molested as a young boy in the church he grew up in and his brother now pastors that church that he grew up in and he hadn't been back to that church in many years 40 years or so his brother invited him to come preach and and he said um sure I'll come well not long after his brother called and he said the man who molested you he was backslidden but he prayed back through and he's gonna be here and and he said you don't have to come and he went anyway and who do you think was the first person he ran into when he pulled up to the church was that man. And I said, my God, what did you do when you saw him? He said, I embraced him. I'm thinking, oh, my God. He said, if God forgave him, filled and refilled him with the Holy Ghost, who was I, he said, not to forgive him? He said, besides, it would have forfeited my great future. And this man is an amazing man. He's an engineer. He's a doc, he has a doctorate in psychology. He's a minister. He builds churches, designs churches, architect. He's brilliant, amazing, and he's helped so many people across the UPCI that have been injured in some way. <clears throat> he, um, I was desperate to forgive. I really was desperate to forgive because... Look, I didn't know about forgiveness. I was in the world, and you just hold a grudge, and you just hate people, and you, you don't care, and you want to get revenge and all this stuff. I did not know, and I did not really want to know what the Lord had to say about it. I kind of wanted to breeze over that one, but, but I realized that, that I needed to forgive. But this is the way, it's so powerful, this is the way he counsels people who have been injured to forgive. He said, Father... I ask you to go to the Lamb's Book of Life and find their name and say their name. Say the name. The po there's, there's power in a name. Don't just say them, those, their name, first and last name. Go to the Lamb's Book, find their name, and everything that is against them that they've done unto me, blot it out. Don't hold it against them. He's like, if I, I have forgiven them, and I ask you to forgive them as well and I have to be honest I was saying it with my mouth and with my head out of obedience 
but it was never happening in my heart. And he did say, it doesn't have to happen in your heart. Forgiveness is a, is a verb. You don't have to feel it. It's not an emotion. But I wanted to feel it because I really did. It was, the head was saying something and the heart was not in agreement at all. So I was desperate to forgive. And then it happened supernaturally. I shared with the ladies how Joseph was a, um, was a lifeline. His story was a lifeline for me. And the fact that he endured 13 years of hell, 13 years, he did the right thing, and yet he, he endured. He was lied on. He was sold as a slave. He had a, um, a, a sex charge against him. It was really bad. All, all the while, he was trying to do the right thing. And, but in the end, I knew how it ended, and I knew he triumphed in the end, and that gave me great hope that he made it to the end. It was one day. He was in the prison, and Pharaoh had a dream. And, the, and the, 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 the butler, he said, oh, I remember. There was a man in a Hebrew in there, and he, he uh, interpreted my dream. Pharaoh called him up. He shaved, put a robe on him. He interpreted the dream. He became governor like that. God can change our situation just like that. And I said, God, if you did it for Joseph, there's a reason Joseph's story is so important to me, and I'm holding on to this for hope. So think about Joseph. He, when he came face to face with his brothers, he could have gotten really good revenge on them. He could have killed them. He could have tortured them. He could have put them in that nasty dungeon where he had to spend all that time, but he didn't because he got the revelation. He embraced them, and he was kind to them instead. And this is when I got a revelation. Psalm 105, 16 through 22. It says, moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them. Oh, my God. When, it, I, when, when I read this, it hit me so hard. Joseph, who was sold as a slave, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his, his word came to pass. God has a time frame for our pain if we can endure it. Don't get out of the heat. Don't get off the potter's wheel until he's finished. The king, the word of the Lord tested him. Why did God have to test him? The king sent and released him, Pharaoh did. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler over all of his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Don't you think Joseph needed to learn a few things from that 17-year-old entitled kid? until this moment where he's teaching elders something? Would in God's name would he have taught elders how good his dad was as, as opposed to his brothers? He, had, he knew nothing. He was wet behind the ears. God had to remove him from his father's house to toughen him up a little bit and, and prepare him. When I read this, and I, God called for the famine, and God sent a man God sent Joseph. I realized that those who hurt me were only the vehicles God used. They didn't orchestrate it. God orchestrated this for me and you to prepare us for our great calling. Joseph had immense power and influence. And God will never give a man of God, someone he's using, power and influence until he's been tried and tested and then when the word came to pass all right joseph you're ready you've been in the oven long enough you've been on the potter's wheel long enough i've made you a vessel of honor you have passed the test now you're ready for your promotion i was so free when i read that and got the revelation I want to send these people a thank you note. You got to send your perpetrators a thank you note. Thank you for helping this along so I could get to my, my place of victory, my place of triumph. I want to share this powerful story with you. It was so awesome. One of the ladies who was at the conference, her name is Angela Ramos. 
and she, um, she was delivered at the altar in such a great way. It was so funny. I spoke the word of faith. It wasn't funny at all because I was like way after lunch, and they didn't have lunch. They had not had lunch yet. So I'm like, why don't we just call this conference, you know, over? Let's just move on and go home. The will of God was done. No, we're going to go forward. I'm thinking, okay, it's me standing in your way like it's 12.04 right now. Your stomach's growling, and you're like, hurry up with the stories. But um, so I was there, but thank God the will of God was done. So this woman, Angela, uh, I spoke the word of faith. Nobody came, and I'm thinking to myself, so many people in here. I don't know you, but I know you need deliverance. One person, this woman, she came barreling out into the altar, and she lost it, and God delivered her. And after she did, it was just like the dam that broke. All these women came out. It was like a a, a bobby pin fest. It was just all over the place. They were getting with it. They're from Detroit. So they were, they had a lot of things they were trying to get delivered from. But she, after, I mean, you know, Detroit's pretty rough. So we're sitting in front and at the church and, and people are still in the altar. And she's like, I want to talk to you. She said, I want to let you know what happened to me. She said, I, um. I, my husband was killed, um, that's Angela, but this was her husband many years ago, was killed by gunfire, and she said, and then uh, 10 years ago, my son was killed, he was shot, and she said, in court, I forgave the shooter, but she said, I could not forgive the two other people who were with him, antagonizing him to shoot my son. And she said, for 10 years, I've held on to this grudge and this bitterness and this unforgiveness in my heart. And at the altar, she said, I was delivered. She said, I I just let it go. And she said, and I feel so free. And, And she began to tell me her story. She's gone through serious depression, serious depression. She tried to commit suicide when she was pregnant. She, she suffered loss and tra- tragedy and physical hunger. She literally said, I would, after my husband died, I had my kids to take care of. And she said, I would, I would go to work and I'd work a 12-hour shift and I was so hungry. I would go to the store and just pray somebody would give me something. She said, I was so hungry. And I was like, oh, my God, I was so overcome by her story. I was like, sister, you need to utilize that pain for something positive. Do you realize the women who could, the people who could benefit from your life? Oh, my goodness. And I said, I said, you, I, I need to connect you with Talisha. So I'll tell you who Talisha is, and that's another story. So I said, come here, Talisha, and because she had, Talisha kind of had talked about her ministry prior to me talk, speaking, and I connected them, and, and as we're talking, a tongue and a tongue interpretation went forth. I have never in my life, and as I, as I was saying, uh, we were talking, we were engaged in our talking, and there's this tongue. I wanted to say, shh, we're talking here. But the Lord broke into the conversation, and this is what he said. I'm not finished with the work in you. Now go out and share it. I was like, Oh, my God, Angela, do you realize that that word is for you? Oh, my God, how much more clear? I mean, you don't need a building to fall on you. You need to go out and do the work. I was just amazed. And, and I texted her Wednesday, and I told her, I said, could you send me some pictures? I really want to talk about your story. It's so powerful. And she was thrilled to death. So, Angela, if you're watching today, God bless you, my sister. We were blessed by your story. <clears throat> Another woman, she came to me, and it was like all these different people. Because, you know, when you're delivered, you want to tell somebody about it. It's so powerful. And she came to me, and she was in my ear, and she said, well, you know, my my daughter was molested by my brother-in-law for 12 years. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I thought she was going to tell me God delivered, you know, her from that anger and resentment. She said, no, that's not it. And she said, and I forgave my brother-in-law. I'm like... Okay, and then she said, but I want to let you know that forgiveness is supernatural. She said, I believe that God will honor the process, the process of doing what Dr. Hughes said. God, go to the Lamb's Book of Life, and and you do it out of obedience. And then one day, it won't just be released from your mind. It'll be released from your heart. And, And 
That's powerful because um, that's, that's what will happen to us who are here today. A lot of us have some things that are shoved deep within our souls that need to come out. We need to get rid of them so we can be free. There's so much that it's held us back from, and we need to be loose today. Uh, I, what you have endured in your life has impacted you so greatly. Every part of your life, it's impacted. The way, you, the way you're a parent, the way you're a spouse, the way you interact with people, the way you do life, it has affected you. It's affected your personality. It's stolen your vibrancy. It's done more than we think it has done in our lives. So, but with all that, with all that has happened to you, there's great empathy and there's great compassion for other people who have suffered the same. You know why? I didn't have a son or a husband killed in gunfire, but Angela did. So she knows what they're going through. She knows what they're feeling. By the grace of Almighty God, I've had some things happen to me. By the grace of God, I wasn't molested. But if you were, use that. Utilize your pain and help somebody else because you speak their language. So don't allow bitterness to be an acid that destroys you. And for, all, for, for God's sake, don't allow your perpetrator to win any longer. No more. No more. Don't give them another second of your life. Let this be a catalyst that pushes you into your ministry. I mentioned a girl by the name of Talisha, and, and we, I had just have such a connection with her. She's so amazing. Her and her husband, John, they're on Brother Hoffman's pastoral team. But a couple of years, we've been going for like three years, but two years ago when we went, she had just started this ministry. She's got an unbelievable testimony that I did not even know about. She was raised in church, but then she backslid a few years. She, um, she had two abortions. She was raped by a boyfriend. She was, this one guy stabbed her in the head with a pair of scissors and her hands have, have scars all over them. And, but the greatest um, thing, play, the thing that plagued her the most was the abortions. She couldn't get over that. And so she went to the homeless shelter with these women who had been homeless their whole lives. And, and she began to minister them to them about their abortions. And then she realized, my God, that's not that that's the least of their problems, but their problems are so complex that they need more than just for me to talk about this. So she began to share her story. You would never know it. She's just so, so beautiful, so pure, so amazing, so passionate. You would never know that she went through what she went through. And she made herself vulnerable with these women. And now they can, they know there's hope for them. This, um, you can go to the, um, the one with, with the women. They, all five of these, four of these ladies, I think there was one more, was at the um, women's conference. The one, no, back up. The one on the left, she's been homeless for 20 years. She got the Holy Ghost. And this woman in the white sweater, this sweet, sweet lady, as she prayed, she was just so downcast, like she didn't feel good enough to even pray. And Tal Talisha was telling me that her mother, when she was just a few years old, would pour boiling water on her hands. Her little hands are all, all scarred. And she said, she has opened up to Talisha. She loves her. She knows she because she knows, they know that Talisha loves them. She ministers to them three times a week, and she works a full-time job. And she said, when my mother was on her deathbed, she said, I told her I forgave her so that she could just die in peace. And I thought to myself, oh, my God. But they were so excited about the Holy Ghost and what they were feeling. And Talisha said, because when she spoke about her ministry, she said, you see these five women? They're the most important women in this whole building. And that's the truth. That is the God's honest truth. And especially to her who's ministering to these people. But in two years, her ministry has gone international, literally around the globe. She is doing a Zoom call to Japan. They have Japanese people. That's another story in and of itself. 
but who are translating to Japan. They have Iraqis in the church who are translating to people in Iraq. And in two weeks, she's going to be sharing her testimony on Arabic Facebook Live page to 7,700 members in 65 countries. You know what she did? She made her pain count. She didn't say, oh, I was in, and look, I'm not making light of it. Please don't get me wrong. Oh, I can't go on. I can't go on. The hell you can't go on. Excuse me. You can go on. We're going to go on. We're going forward. Sorry. Sorry. It had to come out. We're moving forward. Yes, we are. Woo! She gave God her little lunch. Here it is, God. It's nothing much. She's not like a brilliant woman, an educated woman. She's got a high school education. She, she, here, God, here's my lunch. And you know what he did with it? He ignited it. And he, he set it ablaze. And it's gone all over the world. All over the country, too. So we were at dinner, and she's, I never really heard her whole story and where this ministry was birthed, but she said in 2008, Jamie Albritton shared her testimony to the congregation, and she said, my life was changed. She started by saying, hi, my name is Jamie Albritton, and I'm a murderer, because she had abortions, and she was on drugs, and, and she had all these things, but she shared this. She made herself vulnerable. She made her pain count, and, and she passed the baton to Talisha, not even knowing it. She said, and when, and, and for years she did nothing with it until she, it was reignited at BOTT when they were talking about seven, the ministry seven, with her habits and hangups. And she said, I actually have a picture of Jamie Albright in my prayer closet. And she said, I, I, I'm devastated that she's, that she's gone, that she died. And she said, I've been wanting to... Um, Tell her husband what a great impact she's had on my life. And I was like, oh, my God. She said, but I don't know if he, you know, if, if he'll be okay with uh, me reaching out and contacting him. I said, he just called my husband today. I dialed his phone. I handed it to, her, it to her. We're in a restaurant, just sat down, getting ready to order. She's weeping. He's crying on the other end of the phone, so thrilled that his wife's legacy is still carrying on. So powerful. God is so amazing. All the way in Michigan, she'd been praying to be able to talk to him. It was just so, so amazing. And Greg asked her, would you mind in the future, when the time is right, would you mind telling this story to my girls and my son when they're old enough and, and they're, they're well enough to receive it? And she said, absolutely. I want to share this last story with you. Um, it was so incredibly powerful. I was struggling because I'm so unorthodox and nobody really says hell up here unless they're talking about hell. <laughs> Heaven and hell and, you know, but hell, you know, we, 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 nobody really says that. But anyway, <laughs> I was struggling. Huh? Nobody better say it. Sorry. Maybe, maybe I'll get fired. I don't know. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I was struggling about this message and, and talking to you about it because I'm like, you, maybe you don't want to hear about Michigan. Like, get on with it. We don't really, really want to hear it. But I was like, it was so powerful to me. I wanted to share it with you. And before I share what she wrote, I have to tell you what happened to me. I'm in service and it was, I didn't speak on Friday, but I spoke Thursday and Saturday. So I'm walking in the crowd, and I never saw this person before. She was where Brother Henson is. And she was a clone of someone who was here and someone who left this church abruptly, and I never got closure with. And the whole time we were away, she was sending us beautiful text messages and beautiful, heartfelt, emotional text messages and I felt so comforted by her words and and then when I saw her clone it, I was so broken because I thought God you're so good this when I tell you he saw her I didn't know she went to the church but he saw her the following day and he couldn't believe it either but I went to her and I said I'm just so overcome by you because you're a clone 
of someone who left our church and it hurt me really deeply. I said, but it feels so good to be near you. It's like God allowed me to experience that. So, of course, I told, I told the story. And then I get this Facebook message on Thursday morning. This is what she said. <clears throat> Hey, Sister Trinicost, I was at this She Went conference at First Church this past weekend, and I just wanted to say your message changed my life. There was a lady there who previously had an affair with my father for seven seven years ago. I've been coming around First Church for a few months now, but her and I have not spoken or looked at each other because of the uncomfortableness of the previous hurt. I've been praying for months now that God would move in the situation and help to rekindle it, especially since I had been around her more recently. On Thursday night during altar call, I began to pray really hard that God would prick her heart to come apologize to me because it was something I've never received. She was singing on the platform for an altar call, and about five minutes later, she set her microphone down and walked off the platform came right up to me and apologized and cried in my arms, asking for forgiveness. It was surreal, and I felt an overwhelming peace in that entire situation. Then on Saturday, again, your message did another miracle in my life. Just like you mentioned, that there was a lady there who looked just like the lady who had hurt you. That same thing happened to me that day. I was praying, and I felt I had forgiven, forgiven everyone I needed to forgive. And then all of a sudden, I looked to my left, and my jaw dropped. There was a guest there who looked exactly like someone who had really hurt me and a few uh, hurt me just a few months ago. Someone who I know will never be sorry, which is harder to forgive someone knowing they aren't sorry and will never be sorry for hurting you. Anyways, she said, I felt I had already forgiven her this past weekend, but when I was staring at her, wasn't actually her, but looked exactly like her. How weird is that? I realized God was showing me I hadn't truly forgiven yet. I tried to fight it, but moments later, I fell backwards in my seat and just began to sob. I begged God to please help me not have any bitterness and to not have any bad thoughts toward her. I didn't want to have any of those feelings or let them consume me, but I realized I could not do it without God's help. I feel completely delivered. And so full from this weekend, I just wanted to let you know. I'm so thankful I went and thankful I had the opportunity to hear you. You were directly in in line with God. So in closing, I just thought that was so powerful that God did the same thing for her. He just, he's just amazing like that. And I took that, y'all can, y'all can come to the music. I took it as, wow, it wasn't just for me, but she did this too. And it happened to her too. She's so beautiful. Unforgiveness and bitterness can hold us back in untold ways. And as I said, many of these women didn't even realize they were being held back. Many of us don't even realize we're being held back right now. <clears throat> but our, our perpetrators don't deserve any more of our time, of our mental energy, of our hearts, of our anger, of our grudge. They don't deserve it. They're not worth it. And you know what? Remember, forgiveness is not about them. It's about you and it's about me. Why don't we let ourselves off the hook today? We got to let ourselves off the hook. So if you're ready to turn the page and make a change in your life, would you stand so you can step out in the aisle, you can come to the altar, you, you got to have some, some jumping room and some, some dancing room and some hickamaho room because we're going to have some victory. We're not crying. We're going to do some repenting. We're going to do some things before we get there, but we're not crying over this anymore. It's over and it's done with and it stays at the altar today. But I want to let you know that your outcome depends on you, depends on you. God is here to deliver you and to set you free, but you have to be willing to open your heart and you have to be willing to make yourself vulnerable. Men, 
This is not just a women's message. This is to the men as well. You need to forgive and to forget some things as well. I know what's happened to you is painful and it's unforgivable. And I know that the person does not deserve you forgiving them. But as I said, it's not about them. You never have to tell them you forgive them. You just tell the Lord, I'm letting this go. I'm getting rid of all this unforgiveness. I'm letting it out of my spirit so that I can become, I can become who you've created me to become. Jesus said it like this. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, this is painful, their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiving does not mean you have to get back in a relationship with these people. You don't. Forgiveness means I'm just letting it go. I'm no longer drinking the poison. I'm pulling the root of bitterness out of my soul and throwing it away from me. So we're going to start. We're going to start because we need to do some repenting. We've held on to this unforgiveness far too long. We've talked about it far too long. So I want you to ask God to forgive you for holding on to it, for not trusting him and not obeying his word. So let's begin to repent of our sins. Open your mouth because the devil's not going to mute us any longer. Have mercy, God, upon my soul. I have held a grudge. I have been angry. I have been bitter. I have, I have hated and I have desired revenge. And I pray, God, right now in the name of Jesus, that you would forgive me. Forgive me, God, for holding that revenge and that hatred in my heart. You've been trying to dig it out of me, God, and I haven't let, let you get a hold of it. I pressed it deeper so that it wouldn't come out because I've been ruminating on it and marinating on this, this ugliness, God, and I can't go further until I ask you for your mercy for this situation, oh God. I need your mercy. I need your mercy, God. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. Forgive everybody in this house for holding on. We're going to pray the prayer right now that Brother Dr. Hughes said to pray. We're going to ask the Lord to go into the Lamb's book. I want you to say that. Go into the Lamb's book and find their names. And I want you to say the names of the people. First and last name. you got to get specific. First and last, God, go to find their names and, and see what they've done against me. And God, I'm asking you to blot it out. Don't hold it against them. Don't hold it against them, God, because I've forgiven them. And I want you to forgive them because I want you to forgive me. I don't want anything holding up the flow. I want to go deeper in your spirit. I want to become everything that you have for me to become. So God, today, I'm releasing it. I'm letting it go today. I'm letting it go, oh God, today. I want you to repeat after me. I am ready to forgive and forget so I can finally move on into all that you have for me. In a minute, I'm going to speak the word of faith and we're going to go high. We're not crying over this anymore. You've cried many tears. You've cried long enough. It's time to rejoice. It's time, time to give the devil a bad day today. He's held you back too long. It's very important to make sound with our mouth. When we cry out in desperation to God, demons tremble. They tremble. They hate it. Our sound is going to move matter. It's going to move situations out of our lives. So it's time to begin to raise the decibels and open up our mouths. This violation has muted you long enough. This is what the devil has done to you. He's muted your mouth. It's time to take off the mask. It's time to take off the mute. 
take off the harness off your mouth and begin to raise your voice in victory. So when I speak the word of faith, they're going to go high and we're going to shout unto God. We're going to let the all hell is going to tremble when we shout, when we shout from deep in our bellies. So let's prepare our minds. Close your eyes. By the authority of the word of God, by the power that is in the name of Jesus, there's power in the name of Jesus. And by the authority and the anointing of the Holy Ghost in this house, be loosed. Forgive. Be loosed. That's it. Raise your voice. Raise your voice. Raise your voice.